Hello, everybody. Maya. Hi, Maya. Maya is one of my students who asked a wonderful question, which I'm going to be talking about in a moment. So very good. And we have a lot of people joining, so it's great. That's great. So that's fantastic. So thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, I will start with a few words to introduce myself. Um, I'm the president of the American Hungarian Library and Historical Society in New York City. Uh, we are currently uh, welcoming you to our virtual Hall Talk series uh, with um, all sorts of um, Hungarians or Americans who have made a contribution to Hungarian culture, science, or um, literature, obviously, being a library. And uh, we are very happy to welcome Andy to uh, Andrew to speak about uh, uh, one of the foremost Hungarian photographers, uh, Andrei Kertész, and I hope he will share his uh, personal experience and knowledge of him. Um, just to tell you a little bit about the American Hungarian Library, we, we were established in 1955. We are, we have a, a actual library in the Hungarian house on the Upper East Side, and we hope to welcome you there in, in the near future because we are completely renovating it. And we hope you will join us as members. So um, it's, I'm very excited about this event. So um, uh, Andrew and uh, his sister have been very close to the library. One of their um, relatives, Mami Nini, was a old, old uh, long time member of the board. And so there's all sorts of connections, uh, not just Hungarian, but also personal. And, and I think, Andrew, you will, you will talk more about personal connections, hopefully. Um, Some of them. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Andrew is a professor at Wesleyan uh, of classics, uh, and uh, he has been there for a long time. And I think it must have been one of your first uh, or in your early stages that you actually organized an, an exhibition about Andre Kertész uh, in the 70s, I understand, when he was still alive. Uh, I certainly did. <laughs> And this is this is the little catalog of which a very few still remain. So I will. Uh, what do we well, think? I just set a couple of rules, Andrew. Sorry. So we, we are yep. welcoming any questions. So please um, uh, type in your question into the chat room, and uh, we will look out for them. Or uh, please uh, raise your hand or a short Q&A around uh, 7.15 for 15 minutes. Um, and um, you can ask your personal questions then, but uh, please uh, keep uh, muted until then. Uh, but please do ask any questions uh, that you would like to. Uh, Andrew, so please, um, I hand it over to you and um, thank you very much for, for joining. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Um, <clears throat> let me get this set up. All right. At this point, I hope, uh, are you seeing, no, you're not. No, we are not yet, no. Okay. Well, now we can see it. All right, so let me make this a little bit better. Ooh. So, this should be a bunch of Finno-Ugaritic language and a date, right? <laughs> yes. Do you see America in Magyar Könyvtár? Yes, very good. Then we are in good shape. Folk, it is such a pleasure for me to be here with you. I'm so grateful to you for being here with me. This is going to be what our 19th century predecessors called a ramble. That is to say, hey, and a more or less semi-formal, unplanned walk through a couple of topics, but the unifying feature is photography. And the first person I'm going to talk about is Andre Kertész, uh, or Kertész Andre to do the Hungarian version, who was and still is for me a desert island photographer. I'm showing you here an image that we'll come back to that he made in the winter, obviously, during uh, while he was living at 2 Fifth Avenue, just above Washington Square Park. I want to just give this to you as a, a little aperitif because it's such a beautiful picture. 
I got interested in photography uh, while I was in college at the University of Michigan. And in 1968, the publisher Grossman came out with a small book called The Concerned Photographer. There's yet another Hungarian connection here because Cornel Kappa, who was the editor of that volume, was originally Friedman Cornel, and he was the younger brother of the famous combat photographer Robert Kappa. Uh, some of you certainly know his images, either of the landing at D-Day or perhaps the most famous one of a Spanish Republican soldier at the moment of death, soldier falling backward with his rifle in his outstretched hand. But this book, The Concerned Photographer, brought together the work of six photographers, and one of them was Cartes. And it was to Cartes's work that I was most immediately drawn. This is what you're seeing now is a picture I think I took <laughs> in, in the mid 1970s when I was preparing with my then colleague Richard Field, who was curator of our university art collection, an exhibition of Andre's photographs. This is Andre in his apartment at 2 Fifth Avenue. But I need to give you a little bit of background. He was born in 1894 in Budapest. His father was a bookseller. His mother ran a coffee house. They were educated, but certainly not wealthy. Comfortable enough, certainly. And around 1912, we think, that is around when Andre had just finished with some difficulty his high school, they gave him and his brother Yene a little camera. Uh, it made tiny, I don't know, can you all see me or not off to the side? Yeah, we should be seeing you, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, this made tiny glass plate negatives. And Andre, I forgive me, his name at that time was Andor. He was Kertes Andor. Uh, and they gave him and his brother a camera and Andor and his brother Yene plunged into making photographs, sharing the camera, sharing the process of developing these tiny negatives and printing them. This is one of the earliest photographs that still survives. And as you can see, it's of a well, I think you can see this, on the great Hungarian plain, the Pusta. Jena is sort of lost interest, but Andor became passionate about this medium. And he very early realized its ability to capture remarkably fleeting moments. This is one of the things photography does best. One of my students who I think is here this evening, thank you, Maya, asked me during our class or just after our class this morning, what makes a great photographer? And it was one of those questions that I thought, oh my God, I've been thinking about photography for close to 50 years and I have no idea, but I scrambled, struggled, and finally came up with the idea that a great photographer is one who produces a number of wonderful images. The late great curator of photography at the Museum of Modern Art, John Sharkovsky, who gave Andre a very important show in 1964, Sharkovsky said that in photography, everyone's entitled to a silver bullet. Because unlike painting or drawing or printmaking, or much less sculpture, with photography, anybody can make one great picture. It's that kind of small d democratic medium. But what Andre did, and what the second photographer whom I'm going to talk about this evening, a much earlier one, William Stillman did, was to make a number of truly great pictures. This is one that Andre made in 1915 in Budapest in a park. Here I'm going to digress to a small autobiographical reminiscence. 
because after the concerned photographer came out in 1968, I. I just kept looking at it and looking at it and looking at it. Uh, the copy I have is so worn as to be uh, almost loose leafed. And at some point later, I asked my mom, my mother, why did I have to explain that? You know what I'm on. I asked my mom, have you heard of a Hungarian photographer named Kertész? And she said, Kertész Andor? Of course. He's Marta Ács's brother in law. And <laughs> So, Ach Marta. And it turns out that Mrs. Ach or Ach Marta had been in Budapest, the private secretary to my grandfather, Kornfeld Moritz, and my godfather, Corin Ferenc, who were in business together. So, at this point, you can hear the tiny Disney voices singing, It's a Small World After All. And so I said, Do you think I could meet Mr. Kertes? She said, Of course. So my mother called Marta Ach, Marta Ach told Kertes, Kertes said fine, gave me the no. So long story short, on one Sunday afternoon, I remember this quite vividly, I turned up at their apartment at 2 Fifth Avenue, like a good Hungarian young man, carrying a bouquet for Erzibet, his wife, and a box of chocolates what more should one do? And they were very kind. They invited me in. One of the things I noticed, I'll come back to this a little bit later, is that the apartment smelled wonderful. And it was because Erzibet was a perfumer. Uh, she had a highly successful boutique company for perfumes and makeup. But we talked and talked and talked. And that was the beginning of what became a friendship of some 10 years. The reason I mention all of this background is that I'm going to be talking very personally about Andre. We actually, we became friends. And this was at a time when his prints were starting to be highly sought after. And in my very shy way, I had started collecting photography in 1970 uh, with Ansel Adams. But uh, I asked Andre if I could buy some pictures and he said, of course. So I said, I love this one. And he said, ah, this is the way one usually sees it reproduced. But the one that I got from him, he said, was made before the glass plate broke. And so you can see on the right side of the image, the edge of the this shrub they're out in public they're in a park in budapest so instead of the enclosed intimacy suddenly it's it adds this kind of openness and this sort of urgency to the picture uh, i still have it and i still love it uh, they eventually got married andre went to the wedding but one of the things I love about this, as you can see, I don't know if you all, I, I ask this to my students, can you see my cursor as it's moving around the screen? Okay, because you very can see- Very small, yeah. It's very small, but um, <laughs> it's worth, see what you think. But the link of the arms here is so beautifully done. And the expression on her face which is affectionate, but amused and a little bit, perhaps embarrassed a little, whereas he is, he's ready to go, you know, <laughs> and, and there's something about this, the good humoredness of this, the, the warmth of it, that is actually typical of a lot of the Kertes photographs. Kertes was enlisted, and I use the phrase advisedly, in the Hungarian army during the First World War. He was injured, his left arm and hand were struck by a bullet and he was sent to Astergom uh, for the cure and he brought his camera. And while there, he made this absolutely astonishing picture called simply Underwater Swimmer. No one had seen a picture like this before, but for Kertes, this was the, the distortion created by the water, the, the near disappearance of the swimmer's head, the odd elongation and 
torsion in his limbs and this beautiful kind of diagonal mark across the frame. Uh, it struck him, like I said, this is a revolutionary photograph and has since come to be recognized as such. I'm coming back to Budapest. Kertész lived for a brief time and rather unhappily working in the stock exchange and then decided that he had to go to Paris. At the age of 31 in 1925, he went to Paris and he immediately fell in with both a group of Hungarian emigre artists and with some of the most important young artists working in the city at the time, people whose names you will recognize, people like Chagall, uh, Mondrian, the American Alexander Calder, all of these he photographed. And there he became famous as a photographer. This is one of his most famous pictures called Satiric Dancer. Uh, it's a, she, she was Hungarian. This was part of the Hungarian expat community there, Magda Firstner. And it was in the studio of another Hungarian, a sculptor, a modernist sculptor. This is uh, Beati, I believe is his name. And this is one of his pictures here. And I believe this is the Venus of Willendorf, if I'm not mistaken. But you can see in this famous picture called Satiric Dancer, Magda kind of mimicking the contorted pose of the sculpture. And Andre using the camera's ability to separate out a detail, to torque the perspective a little bit, and to convey some of the, some of the giddiness of this artistic life. Paris was, in his later recollection, a kind of heaven for him. He slowly learned French, uh, which he retained until the end of his life. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And he also started exploring the possibilities of photography. Sometimes as here, making this fantastic abstraction out of a completely banal event, which is water rushing down a curb stone. You can see the, the cobbled streets or the, the brick paved streets of Paris and this water rushing around. But what you really have is a band of textures. Uh, this picture has been imitated so often that I, I, you know, I can't even begin to describe it. He also went to places that were famous and made them new. You know, where this, this is the Eiffel Tower, but it's not the standard tourist view of the, you know, the unmistakable pinnacle. Instead, he went up to one of the viewing platforms and made this, this wonderful, I'm sorry, this is a really shoddy reproduction. The original is so beautiful, but looking down and this was he was thinking about what photographs could do this was a time when yeah there's another hungarian of course moholy nagy was thinking as well about the possibilities of photography as the new medium of the 20th century and views from above were one of the most important ways that photographers made unfamiliar made new made artistic the world around them. Cartes got a lot of renown immediately. He actually had one of the, perhaps the first one man show of photography at a gallery called the Sacre du Printemps in Paris. And he traveled throughout France making pictures. This again, I'm, folks, I'm going to bracket here. This is a little digression. Um, this is in no way an art historical exposition of the life and times of Andre Cartes. This is the pictures that I know and love, uh, and some of which I have the immense good fortune to have prints of, including this one. This is called the Carrefour Blois. It was made in 1930. It's about 160 kilometers southwest of Paris, a small town. And 
in again from a, a, a higher vantage point, possibly from a hotel room, Cartes made this extraordinary picture, which is both graphically very sophisticated with all of these different angles and with the texture of the cobblestones under it, and at the same time, a wonderfully witty commentary on the various ways human beings have found to get around, including a saddled horse, a driver in a horse-drawn carriage, a bicyclist, a motorcyclist, and a pedestrian. So you have this combination of formal elegance with some kind of narrative. This was what first I first fell in love with when I looked at these pictures in The Concerned Photographer. Um, Kertes had not been wealthy, as I said, and had been very sparing in his shooting because each, each negative that is originally each glass plate had to be developed, et cetera, et cetera. And so he waited and waited until things were right. And that's one of the things I love about his work. Later, in 1930, he did this series of extraordinary uh, pictures, which were called distortions. They were for a slightly racy men's magazine called Le Sourire, the smile. And Cartes got some mirrors from a, presumably a fun house or something like that. And he had two women posing for him and made this set of distortions, which were both an homage in some ways to the surrealist disfigurement or refigurement of the body that was being explored at the time. When I was talking with him once, I said, which of the distortions do you really like? Because there are about 200 of them. There's a whole backstory to this about how the negatives had become so badly oxidized that they were practically invisible. And then uh, a chemist figured out how to restore them. And there was a book called Distortions published in the mid seventies with an introduction by Hilton Kramer who extolled them as one of the great bodies of 20th century art. I don't think he was aware of the pun, but I asked Andre, what do you liked about this one? And he said, she looks so happy. And he, also said, and he liked the fact that you could see the edge of the mirror here, because none of this is done in the dark room. All of these pictures are made in front of the camera, so to speak. You know, they are recorded on the film. He was not one for doing dark room tricks or manipulations or solarizations or other things that other avant-garde photographers were doing at the time. And one of the wonderful features of these is that there is almost always one bit that is completely in focus, as in the toes here. Uh, when I went to visit Andre in New York, uh, we would, well, first of all, he was very fond of a French aperitif, and I never know whether it's Lillette or Lillet, L-I-L-L-E-T and he liked the orange variety of it. So I would always show up with a bottle of, let's call it Lillet. And we would pour ourselves a couple of glasses and sit down at his desk and start talking about one thing or another. The picture that I showed you at the very beginning, which I think may be the next one, is of Andre in high conversation. He loved to talk. And he spoke what came to be called Cartesian because it was uh, what linguists would call an idiolect. It was a completely unique combination of English, French, and Hungarian, often in the same sentence. My English is relatively fluent, my French adequate, my Hungarian rudimentary but functional. Uh, apologies to all my, my, my fellow citizens. <laughs> but a typical Kerte sentence would be something like, in making a photograph, a leg photoshop, être sincère. Okay, so when you're making a photograph, the most important thing is to be sincere. <laughs> and, 
And uh, I, I think I was one of the few people uh, in his circle who could actually follow Cartesian uh, with a fair degree of fluency. I couldn't respond in kind, but at least I knew what the hell he was talking about. At any rate, there's a nice story to this, uh, even though it's an awful reproduction. A, an English dealer, a friend of mine, said that he had a vintage Cartes press print because Andre made a great success working for the burgeoning industry of illustrated magazines in Paris in the 20s and 30s. And this particular print had on the back the Cartes press stamp. So I bought it. And sort of heart in mouth, I took it to Andre and I said, Andre, look at this. What do you think? He said, it's nice. Let's see it. Julie, you know, that's again, you know, so it's in, and I said, nice composition, good, good, good. And I said, look at the back. And he turned it over and he saw his press stamp and his face turned to all O's, his eyes, oh. <laughs> and, and at first I was worried that he might get angry because this was not to be, you know, this wasn't supposed to be sold. <laughs> this was, this was a working print that should have been in an archive somewhere. But he laughed and laughed. And then he thought, and he said, ah, I remember, I remember, I remember. I'm and I'm and I'm And he had done a reportage on the great chateau of the Loire. And he had made this picture in one of the greenhouses in one of the grand chateaux. Uh, and then he very kindly signed it for me, uh, thereby increasing its value considerably. <laughs> so, but I still have it. I still love it. It's such a sweet picture. But as I said, Cartes projected to the world this image of the amiable Uncle Bundy, but he was in fact deeply embittered. He and Argibet had, had, had left Paris in 1936 and come to New York. They had intended to stay for only a few months, but the growing anti-Semitism, the threat of war in Europe, kept them here in the US. And there followed what Cartes referred to as a kind of exile. His pictures were unfamiliar to an American audience. He took the distortions to the Museum of Modern Art, whose curator Beaumont Newhall admired them, but said that he couldn't exhibit them because they some of them had body hair visible, had pubic hair visible. Life magazine said his pictures talk too much. Um, so he took a job with a variety of periodicals, finally becoming a contract photographer for House and Garden magazine, doing pictures, forgive me, of interiors and gardens and the like. But he also kept up his own work. <laughs> I'm muted, it's okay. Just look at that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's okay, I don't know why it's so famous. I saw it mute on me. Yeah. So, sorry, that happens. He, he took this, oh, and I just got a little banner that says my internet connection is unstable. Thank you. Uh, let's see what we can do. This is a picture that he made from his balcony. He and Ergebet moved into 2 Fifth Avenue in 1952. And he loved the streetscape, the landscape, the humanness of Washington Square Park. And I remember looking at this picture over and over. It has what I've already talked about, which is the extraordinary finesse of design. And it also has the wonderful human element of the two pedestrians. And what Andre said about this picture was that first there was one and it was good. Then there was another and it was perfect. This is what I was talking about a moment ago about the waiting. And gradually his fortunes improved. His importance in the history of photography became 
more and more evident. The famous, much more famous at that time, photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson, whose book, The Decisive Image, is also one of the landmarks in the medium, said that we owe everything to Cartes. And Cartes started to receive the recognition late in life that he so he had long so, he had so long been deprived of. One scholar has said Cartes was like Columbus, who discovered a continent and then had it named after someone else. <laughs> the same things that had animated his work throughout now found new ways of expression in New York. This again is a view probably from his balcony into Greenwich Village with the wonderful angles of this air shaft and a lady looking out tending her little array of flowers. Or this one, which is one of my absolute favorites, made, this one was made fairly early, this is 1947. It's called Homing Ship. It was made in Central Park near the boatyard where boys, mainly boys, and some young men would bring these elaborate toy sailboats, or model, I shouldn't call them toys, these model sailboats, and sail them. They're still there. Now they're, of course, remote controlled, you know, with uh, radios. At the time, they were controlled with strings and long poles. And Kertes went there, and he found what he, this wonderful picture of either a boy or a very young man bringing his big ship back into the boathouse. But what really makes this picture is this, Kertes's fascination with water, with reflections, going all the way back to that swimmer in Estergom or to the sluice of water in the gutter in Paris, now find its expression in the wonderful poise. There's no causal connection after all, between this boat because it's not been sailing on this water, but there's a boat and there's water and there's this wonderful kind of fairy tale animation of this inanimate object and perhaps some imaginary spectators sitting here. I'll come back to Kertes in a moment. We remained friends and for quite a while Every time I went into New York, I would try to go, or most of the time I would try to go visit him and we would talk. I have to tell you one story, as he got older, he got somewhat more infirm and once he fell and for a time couldn't get up and when I was on his back in his apartment. But what he said about this to me afterward was, it was so interesting. I had never seen the apartment from that angle before. <laughs> you know, it's just sort of, what, what can one say? In 1985, I had an extraordinary opportunity. I was invited to be the first guest scholar in photographs at the J. Paul Getty Museum. And the project that I proposed was finally to bring together my two main areas of interest or my passions. And that is antiquity, specifically Greek history and photography. And what I went into was specifically the 19th century, the beginnings of photography in Greece. This is the so-called monument of Philippopos across from the Acropolis, on a hill across from the Acropolis in Athens. And you can see this camera standing here. A very fast bit of all too superficial background. Greece had been since the 15th century part of the Ottoman Empire. It had been ruled by the Turks. The Turkokratia, as the Greeks call it, was finally overthrown in the Greek War of Independence in the 1820s. The memory was still quite vivid even after that. The Greek War of Independence, like the Spanish War of Independence in the 1930s, had drawn partisans from all over Europe, the so-called Philhellenes who fought on the side of the Greeks against the Ottomans. I mention this because it's gonna be important in a moment. After the establishment of an independent Greek state, the first capital was at Nafplio in the Peloponnese. And then it was moved to Athens primarily because of 
Athens' connection with the the gloried past, you know, the cradle, the birthplace, the whatever neonatal image you want to use of it of Western civilization. With the arrival of steamboats and railways, Athens became more and more a destination for foreign tourists as well. And after the invention of photography, Greeks and foreigners began establishing photo studios in Athens, primarily to supply images for this tourist market. This is one by one of the most, one of the earliest and most famous of the Greek photographers named Demetrius Constantino. And the reason I'm showing it to you is, there are a few reasons. One is, it is one of the standard views of the Acropolis. This is the view from the Southwest, which includes the so-called propylia, that is the sacred entryway, visions of the Erechtheion, another of the other major temple, and then some of the theaters here. But I also want to tell you something else, which is you see these things that look like mudslides down from, you see these down from the parapet. The Greek government had attached itself to, had embraced classical antiquity. It's part of its national formation. There's been a lot of interesting work about this, especially by a Greek scholar named Yanis Hamalakis. What they decided to do was to strip the Acropolis of anything that wasn't classical golden age. This had been the site not only of the Ottoman government in Greece, but also of residences, shops, homes, anything that wasn't high classical that is Periclean was unceremoniously scraped up, put into a wheelbarrows and dumped over to side. We'll come back to this too. This is a view, an anonymous view. Some years later, you can see that it's been cleaned up and the theaters have started to be restored. And also, I want to call particular attention to this structure. This is the so-called Frankish or Venetian tower built sometime around 1400 uh, during a brief Venetian occupation and used as part of the fortifications of the Athenian Acropolis. So that's gone. There are two, what I've come to call best general views of the Athenian Acropolis. One of them is this one and the other here in a beautiful 18th century drawing is from the other end, from the Southeast, which includes the monumental, the massive temple of Zeus Olympius, Hadrian's Gate, and then of course the Acropolis and the Parthenon on its top. Probably the earliest photograph made was a daguerreotype made some photography was invented in 1839. This is one of the few major art forms for which we have a definite birth date. It had, like some mythological creature, a double birth, one in France under the auspices of Louis Jacques Mandé Daguerre, whose pictures were made on silver coated copper plates and called daguerreotypes, and the other across the channel in England where the polymathic genius Fox Talbot, William Henry Fox Talbot, whose birthday was a week ago today. I know we all missed it, but oh well. Uh, and Talbot invented the paper negative where he photosensitized a sheet of paper, could put it in a camera, make a negative, then lay that on another photosensitized sheet of paper and make a positive. Um, but there was a Parisian optician and entrepreneur named Larabour who sent daguerreotypists around the world. Their works were collected, transformed, and this is important, into aquatints, 
and then published in a lavishly illustrated volume called Excursion Daguerrean, Daguerrean Voyages, or Daguerrean Excursions. Larabur's daguerreotypists went everywhere from the Middle East and Greece to, yes, Niagara Falls. There is a, a daguerreotype uh, from, uh, from upstate New York. But this is the other view. And a contemporary reviewer of this said that it conveys the intellectual power and the piety of the Athenians. And then when you think that this thing, the original image is about the size of, it's a little bit smaller than a modern sheet of stationery. Uh, you're sort of surprised, but it still gives some idea of how these images were received. But they also became very quickly quite standardized. This is by the great travel photographer Felix Bonfils uh, from the 1870s. And here now again, this is the other best general view, which we've already seen. The primarily tourist or traveler market that made up the principality of buyers for these images didn't want surprises. Many of the photographers, both Greek and foreign, had studios from which they would send out images by post. So that if you were in New York or Washington or Middletown, Connecticut, you could order pictures and you didn't want surprises. If you wanted the Acropolis of Athens from the West, this is what you wanted. As I said, the Greeks were in the process of cleaning up the Acropolis. I just wanted to show you this because they used the, the reconstructed little temple of Athena Nike as a repository for the sculptural images. We're gonna come back to this image in a bit. And photography very, very quickly replaced drawing as the principal medium of reproduction for these views. I just love this. This is another Constantine or Demetrius Constantinou of a young man sketching these, these are the famous Caryatids, the Porch of the Maidens, on the temple called the Erechtheion. This one was stolen, ah, forgive me, was, no, that's wrong, too, was, what's the word I want, saved by Lord Elgin, who took it to London. And so you can see there, she's new, there's urban legend that her sisters still mourn her departure. Never mind. Watch this. This is by another Greek photographer named Atanas, Konstantin Atanasiu. Here is the so-called Frankish temple. If you look very closely, you can see the outline of one of the Ottoman era houses that had been adjacent to this, that had been knocked out. Can you see the little, here's the roof line and here's the uprights. Can you see this at all on your screens? It doesn't matter because it's about to go. The foreign travelers didn't much like this. And so what Athanasiu did was a 19th century version of Photoshop. He simply painted over the negative. This is, this is exactly the same picture, but on this large glass plate negative, all you have to do is apply the ancient equivalent of whiteout and you can do this. So where does this leave us? This leaves us with a few monuments that had to be seen. Every place prescribes its own itinerary. One of them was the massive temple of Zeus Olympius next to the Acropolis. It was very impressive as huge, but again, its attraction was somewhat diminished by the fact that <laughs> an entrepreneur had established a little restaurant here among the pillars. And uh, can you see, there's a gentleman leaning here against the, one of the pillars and there are tables and chairs around. Yeah. Ah, those modern Greeks, they'll get everywhere. Another monument nearby was called, it's now called the Hephaestion. It was called the Theseion, the Temple of Theseus. It is beautiful and actually much less better preserved than the Parthenon, but it was right next to a fairly crowded area of the modern city and so was less appealing. The Parthenon was the crown jewel. What I'm showing you here is a daguerreotype made by an 
extraordinary photographer named Joseph Philibert Giraud de Prangy. Can you say that class? Good. De Prangy was a wealthy amateur who sent himself on a three-year tour of the Mediterranean just after having learned how to make daguerreotypes. The pictures are amazing. They were the subject of a remarkable exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum last year. And what Daguerre, uh, forgive me, that's a slip. What de Prangy did was to go to the East End and make this, this is a very large plate. And you see here some scaffolding, which was being used in a, some reconstruction, I'll show you in a moment. But if you look very closely, you can also see here a much smaller camera on a tripod. This is what he used for architectural details. This, as the scholar Fred Borer has said, is the first photograph of architectural photography. Uh, the first photograph of archaeological photography, forgive me. In Excursion Daguerrean, this is the view that Larabour's daguerreotypist, a Canadian named Julie de Laubinier made. And what you can see here are the remains of a mosque that had been built inside the temple. The Parthenon had survived fairly intact. It had been, of course, a temple of Athena. Then after Christianity came in, it became a church of the Virgin Mary. After the Ottomans took over, it became a mosque. And after it was blown up in a war between the Ottomans and the Venetians, they used the interior as another mosque. And the daguerreotypist has included this workman's shed because what we saw here is the scaffolding that is being used to remove this mosque and to support the remaining columns. Most views of the Parthenon are from the West End, one after another. In fact, in many cases, if you don't have a signature or some other sign, you don't really know who made them. This is again by Bonfils. This is by a a Greek photographer uh, whose name I'm briefly, but it's not Constantinou, but the Greek photographer includes figures in his landscape. We'll come back to this in a moment. But most of them are empty. Because one of the things about these pictures of Athens is that the photographers strive to exclude as many signs as they can of the modern city. And this brings us finally, and this is going to be moving toward a conclusion, the other photographer I'd like to talk about with you very briefly is William James Stillman. In 1985, when I was at the Getty, Andre died. Um, and, but it was then that I found the work of Stillman, which I had not known of before. He was raised in upstate New York, got an extraordinarily good classical education in, at Union College. He went to England he was a painter. He studied with Frederick Edwin Church, one of the masters of the Hudson River School, though he didn't like him much. He went to England in 1850 and fell under the spell of John Ruskin, who was the outstanding critic and intellectual of the day. And here comes, well, one of the last Hungarian connections, because on coming back to the US in 1851, Stillman went to a speech by Lajos Kossuth, who was touring the United States to get support for Hungarian independence from the, I almost said Ottomans, from the Habsburgs. <laughs> and Stillman was mesmerized. Stillman, who is sort of, if you remember the old Woody Allen movie, Zelig, where Zelig keeps popping up in various locations, this is Stillman. Stillman knows everybody. So Stillman befriended Kossuth, then met him again on another trip back to London, and Koshut took, well, let me just say, Stillman volunteered to do whatever he could for the Koshut cause. Koshut said that before leaving Hungary, he had buried the Hungarian crown jewels somewhere next to the Danube. What he wanted Stillman to do was to take a code to a conspirator in Budapest and when put together with what the conspirator had there, the code would reveal the location of the jewels. Stillman agreed to do this. 
in preparation for, I just love this story. I'm sorry, I'm going to take just a minute for this because in preparation for this, he had a special pair of boots made, the heel of one of which was hollowed out so he could carry the cipher uh, secretly. So he went to Vienna, then he went to Budapest. And one thing Koshut had failed to tell him was that the contact there was being looked for by the by the Habsburg police <laughs> and, and was in hiding. So Stillman, looking at his, you know, doubtless elegant little address book, said, oh, there's the address. So he took a cab to the, the place where this guy was staying. And the concierge, knowing that most of the cab drivers were informers for the police, said, there's nobody here by that name. And Stillman said, but wait, I have, the, there's nobody here by that name. Uh, Stillman came back again and uh, by himself and was told repeatedly, you must have the wrong number. So Stillman rather forlornly wandered around Budapest for some days, for quite some time. And then he noticed that the heel of the specially made boot was getting perilously thin. He couldn't take it to a cobbler to have it fixed because you know any boot maker would say, what the hell is this? Uh, and so he finally, one night, he describes all this in his autobiography, is quite wonderfully funny about his own misadventure. He went down to the Danube and he heard footsteps approaching. So he took his boots off and threw them in the river. Huh. And he was right because he was then accosted by a guard. Where the hell are your shoes? And Philman, uh, Stillman, sorry, said something like, Ich bin ein Fremder, which means something like I'm a foreigner's. And the guy started laughing and said, foreigners, go back to your hotel. <laughs> you know. And, um, some years later, Stillman met with Koshut again and said, remember, I was the one who took this. Koshut denied it. And Stillman said, I still have your letters. Uh, you know. And so, so that's the end of our Hungarian portion. But Stillman had an amazing career. He became the founder of the first serious American Journal of the Arts called the Crayon. He then embarked on a position as a diplomat. He was consul first in Rome, where he seems to have taken up photography, and then in Crete. Crete was still under Ottoman domination. Stillman supported a Cretan insurrection against the Ottomans, and be, life was so dangerous that he became persona non grata and fled to Athens. He had three small children at the time, and his wife was sadly unbalanced or mentally ill. And shortly after their arrival in Athens in 1869, she took her life. So there was Stillman jobless, a newly bereft widower with three small children, one of whom his beloved son, Russie, whose godfather was John Ruskin, was starting to show signs of a serious and eventually fatal illness. It was under these circumstances that Stillman undertook to photograph the Acropolis. This is an album, this is a copy of the album. This is in the Getty collection. You can't quite see it, but it's actually autographed by Stillman. This belonged to the great New York collector, Sam Wagstaff. When I first saw these pictures, I couldn't believe them. Stillman had a completely different vision. The Ruskinian tenets, I'm sorry, this doesn't demonstrate this, but in this album there, which was produced in London in 1870 and sold by subscription, Stillman brought a radically new vision to the Athenian monuments, putting them in a living landscape, this one from the Hill of the Muses, or this extraordinary one from the other side with, you can see, see here's, you can see here's the, this is his variant on the standard tourist view, but how different it is. This is a city that's populated, although not very well populated. Uh, the population of Athens, which was then the capital of Greece at this time, was probably around, around 40,000. Uh, Middletown, Connecticut, where I live, is larger than that. Stillman brought the Ruskinian principles of the picturesque, of bold light and shadow, of angles and contrasts to his view as this one of the uh, the sacred gateway, the Propylaea, or this one, which we've already seen. But what I want to point out here 
is his inclusion of a Greek man. This is the characteristically Greek costume called the fustanella, which is the little, the kilt-like skirt that men wore. Stillman's view of the Parthenon is similarly radical, fully frontal, completely symmetrical, and anchored by this amazing retaining wall here. He could have easily gone up here and not had this, but this is part of putting this monument, so to speak, back into history. Stillman wrote about this, uh, about his work. He said, I was unfit for anything but my photography. This is the picture that Arpad used on the one of the invitations, and it's an amazing picture. The reason that I wanted to show it to you is that one thing travelers did was when they went to monuments, as they still do, they often wrote stupid graffiti. They wrote their names on places. Can you see it here? I don't know if you all can see this. For you... Stillman, for Stillman, the monument the Parthenon was not defaced, but ennobled because these are the signatures of foreign Philhellenes who had fought in Athens during the War of Independence. You can see here the name of one, you can't see it, but I can, one Colin Blondel Philhellen. So for Stillman, the Parthenon becomes not just a symbol of Greek antiquity, but of modern history. He even posed himself under this seemingly precariously balanced column drum. Uh, this is undoubtedly him and he's looking out over the plain of Athens. He had a scaffold built to go up where no other, certainly no other traveler photographer, travel photographers had gone to the top of the Parthenon to show its prospect over the landscape and in the far distant the Mount Pentelikos, where the marble from which the Parthenon building was quarried, uh, where the Parthenon was made, had been quarried. Or down to ground height. Here, he said in the caption to these pictures, this is the pictures are always just a picture on one side and a brief caption on the other. And he said that this picture illustrates the curvature of the stylobate. Stylobate is this top stone course. And in fact, it's some six inches higher here than it is at the corners. The reasons I was talking about this with Arpad are both practical because it allows rainwater to fall off and also because it creates an illusion of solidity instead of the building collapsing under its own weight. And the Stillman touches to put this little figured plaque here in place of the usual figure in a landscape. Most Greek photographers excluded modern Greeks from their views, Stillman did not. His Republican, progressive, one might almost say radical politics manifested themselves in images like this, where a proud Greek man stands at the portico, uh, the Pandrosian as it's called, of the temple called the Erechtheion. And the album ends on a note of quiet triumph. This is one of the little statues of winged victory that used to surround the, it was a, a parapet like a sculptured wall around the temple of Athena Nike. And Stillman is here made at the centerpiece of this, this amazing collage of sculptural fragments. I'll finish with one more, because this is the last view of the Parthenon in the album. Taken from the east side, you can still see the Frankish Tower here, the Erechtheion here, across the way, the monument of Philippapus, where the camera had been next to in the very first picture I showed you. But what I want to tell you about this is it's so amazing because again, Stillman has taken a, what he would say was a scientific view, symmetrical, completely straightforward. But what he's also done is to use 19th century photographic technology. Negatives at the time could not record both landscape and sky at the same time. What Stillman has done here is to make a combination print. There's one negative for the land, and there are, by my count, at least three for the sky. One here, one here, and one here. What Stillman has done is to create an image 
that shows the Parthenon as sort of the source of radiance <laughs> for the landscape. Um, it's amazing. And finally, this brings us back to Kertes, a wonderful picture from the late 1928 from Montmartre. And I sometimes talk about this as my autobiography, me schlepping these old, you know, these old guys around now for, for many years. But it's also a wonderful way to finish uh, with Kertes, with antiquity, and with this talk. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, that was quite fascinating, and I we love these stories about Kosovo, obviously. Uh, <laughs> and 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 we, we have to do a whole show with your impersonation of uh, Andre Kertes. Well, I didn't. One of the things I didn't talk about, I I'd meant to, is that Kertes presented himself as this sweet, happy, avuncular old man. He was actually one of the most angry and bitter people I've ever known. We'd be sitting there at his desk, and after a couple of lilies, he would start shaking his fist and talk about the son of a bitch America. <laughs> or for those of you who speak, America is a curva. Not a word that I heard a lot around my house. It means a whore. Oh. Um, oddly enough, my parents and grandparents never used this term around us, you know. But uh, he 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 was he 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 was full of these things. I don't know, I could talk about Kerte sort of one more and then we stop. And if, if anybody would like to ask any or say anything, please do. But Kerte's had, he was, as I said, he was very sparing with his own use of the camera. He waited. He didn't much care for photographers who had what a motor drive on their camera, which in the old cameras, you could just push down the shutter and go, J -j 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 -j, you know, make dozens and dozens of pictures within several seconds. And you know, and then you could finally pick out one that worked, you know, this is the silver bullet. But uh, Kerte, somebody who speaks Hungarian, Lily, perhaps you can tell me how, what's the expression that even a blind chicken occasionally finds the corn out? A mash, a vaktyuk is talál. A vaktyuk is talál szemet. That's it. A vaktyuk, yeah, vaktyuk is talál szemet. Even a blind chicken occasionally finds the corn. And that was his view of a lot of contemporary photographers. <laughs> he he revered Cartier-Bresson. Uh, he had a kind of uh, uneasy friendship with Brachai, uh, to whom he had given, he gave Brachai his first camera. Uh, and there were a few other photographers, the American Charles Harbutt, who makes beautiful rural views, whom he really liked and admired. But um, uh, he, he, he was a, he was a stony man in some ways. Anyhow, sorry. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to invite everybody to, um, if you have any questions, please, please raise your hand or type it down or, or say something. Um, but I wanted to ask you in the meantime, until, uh, somebody thinks about a question, maybe, uh, what is your personal connection? How, how how did you become a, a, a collector and, and interested in photography? I mean, you've written several books, or at least uh, you've written about photography, like Paul Strandhager and, and many others. I mean, what, what is your personal connection to that? Um, it, uh, now I can, can I do this? Yeah, now I can do this. I couldn't do it before. This, this is my, my original copy of that book that I was telling you about. I, I sort of fell in love with photography. I started looking in the in when I was in college at at photography magazines, uh, which then always had, in addition to the how do you do it parts, uh, a section on the art of photography. And I just found myself more and more drawn in. I learned how to develop film, how to make prints. I had a rudimentary dark room in the basement. And then in 1970, my first year of graduate school, I came home to Washington to visit my family and a dealer in Georgetown, whom I later became very close friends with one, Harry Lunn, who was a Titan. He had a show of Ansel Adams photographs and you could buy them. And I bought one. Wow. It was $200. <laughs> and 
it, I still have it. It's called The Black Sun. It's a beautiful picture. And I just bought it because I loved it. And uh, I had $100 from Christmas. And I think I borrowed 100 from my then uh, lady friend and I bought one. There's a funny story about that too. I brought it home. I said, mom, what do you think? And she said, very nice. How much was it? <laughs> and uh, my, my mother, a thrifty Hungarian, and I didn't apply the usual mom discount, which was at least 50 and usually 75%. But those are nice shoes. How much were they? Fifteen dollars, oh. easy. You know, and you know, so you know, it just. So I told her the truth. I said it was two hundred dollars, and she said two hundred dollars for one photograph. Give me two hundred dollars. I'll give you an album. Uh, and so, <laughs> but that's how it started, and then gradually, this was in the early days when, when the collector's market was just beginning, and I. I got to know the dealers. I got to learn about the medium. I came to love photographers like Ache, whom I could also talk about the great French and the Parisian photographer. Later, Robert Frank, also amazing. Um, and a few contemporaries. So I just, it, uh, there's a book called Collecting the Curious Illness. I say no more because it really is like that. Collecting is a, it's a passion. It's something that draws you in. As you learn more and more about it, uh, it just becomes more and more fascinating. And being able to, being able to share it, to write about it, to think about it, to talk about it is just uh, a, con a continuing pleasure. And Arpad, again, thank you for the invitation. I should have said that at the beginning, but I can at least say it now. We are honored uh, to have you, and, and we'll get you back to make a performance uh, on, on impersonations. But uh, I wanted to ask, do you have a sense why the the, the Hungarian school, like Munkachi, Brasha, Kappa, I mean, a lot of names uh, are internationally well-renowned. They, they got out of Hungary. We are always interested about this connection between America or, or outside of Hungary and back, back in Hungary. I mean, what do you think drove those to come out and, and, and what made them successful abroad? To use an old Irish expression, fogalmam sincs, that is, I have no idea. <laughs> but there really is a, there is a remarkable, uh, I mean, my wife, Elizabeth jokes about this. She said, you look anywhere and you find some Hungarian, you know, sort of at or near the top of the of the profession. And with photography, it's certainly the case. I mean, Kertész, uh, Moholy Naj, Brashai, uh, Munkachi, we were talking about. Martin Munkachi was a great fashion photographer who opened fashion photography. He took it out to the studio and put the models in places like tennis courts and beaches and showed them actually in motion. Um, there are you know, experimental photographers like Kepesh, you know, they're, I have no explanation, but it, it makes me, I, I'm very, I'm quietly proud of, this, you know, this, uh, the prevalence of this. Just to give, anybody has any questions? Uh, I, I have a question. Please go ahead. So do you think it's it's easier to be a good photographer or to stand out today than than in the old old times like with the old not digital cameras that's one question and what do you think it's like in in general like what is going to be happening with photography now that you know everybody's sharing tons of pictures online on on instagram and facebook there you go <laughs> this, this no, it's a great question, Lily, and uh, everything has changed so enormously. The old kind of economy for the circulation of images, everything from printed magazines or newspapers to um, galleries, museums, etc. I mean, the galleries and museums still exist, but especially now after the pandemic or during the pandemic, things have gone, as you know, uh, everything is frozen. But even prior to that, the proliferation of digital imagery has changed things enormously. From 
I, I'm really, I don't, I'm not sure that photography will be, or even still is anymore, a discrete medium. We have what's called camera-based art. And it includes everything from photographs, whether digital or analog, but to, you know, the, uh, what you were talking, you know, Instagram and Photoshop and combinations of photo-based imagery with printmaking and graphic design and painting, um, the walls have been the walls have been leveled. There really are no discrete barriers anymore among these media, and uh, people are still making wonderful images. There are still people whom I would describe as brilliant photographers. Sorry, my eyes still don't have a, a definition for you, but uh, the the it. It's changed, it has changed so fundamentally, so radically in the past few decades that I'm, you know, I, I have to go consult the Oracle at Delphi and hope that she's not lying because I have no idea. <laughs> but I think what I was saying about photo-based art is in fact, is in fact accurate. Emma has a question about the uh, one of the early Katis uh, photog photographs you, you you showed whether there's a you know, there's a forest and whether you can see a deer in it faintly. Do you, do you recall which, that? I wonder which one. Um, in one of the very first ones. But again, I mean, she was noticing the uh, the little details which are quite amazing. Well, that's that one of the things about I I'm I don't want to go back to share screen because I would much rather talk with you all for, for the time being. I honestly don't know, but I will look and I promise I will let you know. Uh, one of the things that I, this is my little sermon moment, is that photographs seem to be so quick, so easy, so immediately comprehensible. In fact, and this is what kept, keeps drawing me in and coming back a little bit to what you were asking a moment ago, Arpad, these are very complicated and multi-layered cultural documents. And they keep, the more you look at them, the, the more they keep yielding, whether it's a deer in the forest or the sort of um, aesthetic concerns that Gertes or Stillman brought to their image making. Um, they, they, repay, they repay just taking a few more seconds than you might normally want to spend and then you'll find them opening up uh, in a most remarkable way. F friends, I think we have taxed your patience long enough. Before we go, I just wanted to say hi to Andy. This is Hans, Hans. Kraus. And remembering all of these